while um, you know the competitive avenue for you, um, I don't want to say it was cut short, but you you opted to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it was actually the fundamentals you learned by being a competitive surfer younger helped you on your current career path? Because it's something I remember mean, Dane Gadowskis and I talked about a lot too, because he's someone who experiments with equipment yeah. too. And he said, yeah, for him personally, he's like, yeah, he's like, I look at like, you know, the NSSA and, and the pro juniors and the QS as kind of, he's like, as like my going to college, you know, right. he's like, I went to college and I got my degree. And he goes, after that, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. Some people go to the CT, he goes, but for me, I got to use it to experiment. You know, he's, I wouldn't be as good on these boards if I hadn't had that competitive edge to me when I was younger. Do you, do you feel the same for, for your own experience? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, you know, I, I, I pressed really hard to learn how to nose ride um, so that I could get good scores, you know, and it, it was um, a, a hard path learning how to nose ride, um, especially, you know, on the board that I was on, but I learned and, um, and I, I learned kind of what, what the maneuvers were, but I still, I still feel like the whole time that I was like dedicated to competing and I've done contests since I, I kind of, um, stopped doing it consistently but um when i was competing consistently i don't feel like my caliber of surfing was uh was i that i just feel like it, it didn't look that great because it wasn't grounded in my own um spirit i i feel like i didn't always give the best representation of the the surfer that I wanted to be, it was only when the waves were like good and, and kind of bigger that I felt like, Oh yeah, I, I showed, I showed what I could do, you know, or I, that's what I can do. Um, and so chasing and only like going on trips and spending all the money on doing these contests, I wasn't developing my surf in or my, my abilities and, and other waves. And, um, that's really, what I wanted to do is to get barreled and to, um, and to go surf different waves that didn't have to be like, you know, for 20 minutes during this heat. And, uh, and that's it. You know, if, if you screw up and whole contest is done and which is amazing. And I love, I love the community that it brings and, and the friends that I have that I've made through contests, um, I'll have forever. Um, so in that sense, like it was, it was definitely so formative. Um, but the freedom that my surfing has felt once I stepped aside from seeking contest results has definitely, um, both brought, uh, evolution in my surfing, um, in a way that I'm not trying to surf to any, anyone's, uh, criteria. I'm not even trying to surf to my own criteria. I'm doing my best to get out of my body's way to like, just let spirit and soul take over. And, and the more that I can like develop my muscle memory so that my feet will do what they need to do and be in the right place um, to allow my soul to take itself to the places that it wants to be on the wave. Um, I, I don't know. I don't want to judge that. I don't want that to be judged. Um, but I want the community. So that's why I've continued to go back to contests is because I want to be around the people that are like pushing themselves to be their very best. Um, but what I have also realized is that there's community outside of that realm as well. There's a lot of people that are pushing themselves just because they want to see what they can accomplish or the feeling for me, it's like, what kind of feelings can I have on the wave? It kind of feels like a roller coaster, right? And, or like snowboarding and like these actual, like the physical feelings of doing an amazing carve or going off the lip or gosh, getting barreled. The, the cellular feelings of that is what I crave and what I seek. And I think that's what other surfers crave and seek too, even on the highest level. Like, 
they still, you know, when a good barrel heat comes in, the guys have like this, you cannot take the smiles out of their face, even if they lost, like those feelings are um, remarkable and they keep us um, salivating for, (laughs) for more. (laughs) Well, and I think that like, while we might be approaching like an era, an era of more specialization in these spaces, Mm. I actually think we're also breaking down a lot of those silos too. So like Mm. you could be at a a competition and as you said, like the, the exchange between people who maybe 15, 20, 30 years ago wouldn't have been as intimate is now pretty free flowing. Like the ideas are being exchanged and it's not just this is a surfer and this is a competitive surfer. Everyone's kind of a surfer, but I want to, I want to get into that because I, I think that's a really important uh, concept on, on how you define yourself and professional surfing or yourself as a professional surfer today and what you're using your platform uh, for, which I think is really, really important. But first we're going to get uh, one more break in to get a word in from our sponsors. So in 2020, and I'm going to go back a little bit, but just starting this conversation in 2020, do you consider yourself a professional surfer? Um, you know, I would, but I guess if you do, how, how do you describe the value in 2020 that you provide to the people that, that may pay for you to go surf for a living? Sure. Um, I guess, yes, I would, I would consider myself a professional surfer, a, maybe a part-time professional surfer. um i um definitely live my life in pursuit of waves um but also in pursuit of purpose and of um being of of service and and giving back um i always i always thought growing up while i was competing that um, a world title or the competition was what was going to give me validity to have a platform to speak and um, for messages to be heard and for love to be transferred, you know? Um, but I think, you know, when I was in college, I, I realized that media um, was a way to translate that love and to empower. Um, and it could either be used to disinform or to lower our vibration, or it could be used to raise our vibration and to, uh, educate and to inspire. Um, and so I, I honestly, uh, attribute my surfing career and my ability to be a professional surfer to social media um, because I was able to make a platform myself and have a voice and have whoever wanted to listen listen and it wasn't controlled by a company saying um, this is who we're going to promote and these are the photos of her that we're going to show and this is who Leah Dawson is. I got to tell my own story and I got to curate that and to show that. And, um, and by wearing my heart on my sleeve and speaking, um, my truth, I found that a lot of other women kind of felt the same as I did that I, I don't feel like I was being spoken to by surf marketing or surf media. I, I didn't feel like I was like, the surfer that I was, was being marketed to at all. All I saw was, you know, if I saw a girl, it was in a bikini or in a G string or, um, or in a competition, that was it. You know, there wasn't a lot of, um, lifestyle women. Cassia was, was pretty much the only, uh, lifestyle female surfer, um, you know, throughout most of, of the two thousands. Um, and she's still able to, to create and influence, uh, the culture today because of, um, uh, her profound, uh, spirit that she is. Um, she's always like nurtured and loved women's surf culture and, and surf culture as a whole. Um, but there, there really wasn't a pathway of professional surfing outside of competition realm. 
I didn't, if I thought that quitting contest was me quitting the, um, the dream of being a professional surfer of whatever that was. And I, now I equate it to, yes, I spend a lot of my time at the ocean and I get paid by, you know, a couple companies, not a lot. I'd love to make more money, you know, (laughs) I definitely live frugally. Um, and I, I definitely want to continue to explore ways that I can utilize my creativity, um, to make income. Um, but I'm, I've been able to do what I love and to explore, um, the, the connection between surf and spirit that I've always been, um, so enamored with and to be able to find community and resonance with women from all over the world who, um, who feel the same as I do that like, we don't want to be sexualized. We don't want to be, um, uh, we don't want to be made to feel less than or compared. We just want to be appreciated for who we are and what we are. And, and just, um, you know, for being a woman, not, not just to, I don't, it's, it's hard for women, you know, learning to surf, especially, you know, now there's Mm -hmm. crowds are tough and, uh, you get called a kook real fast and it takes, um, a lot of determination to, to, um, bust through um, the crowd enough to be able to find your waves and get your waves and, and make the learning curve. Um, so for women there, there's, I just see this like open space that is starting to be filled with, it's not women making a whole bunch of money. It's, it's women making small bits of, of money and here and there and creating business within the surf industry and creating their own types of businesses um, to be able to nurture this, this culture that is undoubtedly expansive. It's just now it's starting to connect itself and it's not by mainstream surf media and mainstream surf companies. It's um, within their own communities and, and within groups and, um, and different blogs and, and different books like that one. And, um, (laughs) <laughs> and and just ex- expression so um i i still feel like i have a lot to grow and and to learn as uh, a professional surfer and i i want to continue to pursue that um but i also know that it's for a duty and it's for purpose and i always asked if i am going to have a career in surfing like i want it to be for something and i want it to be able to make other people's lives better. Um, and that's brought me to the work with changing tides and, um, and really us starting to hone in the ways that we can give back and be of service and to turn on because there's, there's so much in the world that we can care about. And if just going surfing every day is all that we care about, well, it definitely can, um, entertain you day in and day out when the waves go flat, like we got to do something. <laughs> That's right. It is one of those up and down things. I, I actually, geez, there was so much to unpack there because it was just so well said, but I, I think that the success that, that you found um, in this space, your career is kind of, to me, like example number 25,000 of like, there is this very rich, um, fertile surfing community out there and this uh, this idea of surfing and 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 this expression of surfing that kind of what we were talking about before where uh, i'm going to oversimplify but like the the patriarchy that is sort of at the at the heart of a lot of these institutions in surfing and and i say that because it's true and because it's kind of been the way for for decades at totally. this point um and those adopted kind of conservative stances across so many spaces out of that insecurity and that desire to be accepted by the mainstream, you know, have kind of come full circle um, in the last decade because, 
you know, social media and the information age for all its sins has broken open the mechanism to kind of express whatever your idea is to the world, right? And I think that huge growing surfing community that can tap into different types of surfing and want different kinds of surfing has been there the whole time. But as you said, it's like the institutions within the surfing world have kind of been, if you're a woman, you need to look this way. Uh, If you have to ride boards this way and the value is placed on these things kind of thing, which I don't want to be black and white about it because there's certainly value in like, I mean, I work for the WSL. I love watching championship tour surfer, um, (laughs) men's and women's surfing. I love watching them surf on like boards that I probably couldn't stand up on, you know, but I just like watching it. I don't think that has to be like quarantined off from the rest of surfing, but I think it has been, you know, and I think that's why, like, I, I think that's why, again, like you've been, so powerful and influencing so many people and, and using that platform, um, in a lot of positive ways. Yeah. I, I think that what you said, you know, there's a lot more to surfing than, um, the championship tour, but that's mostly what people see Mm. when they see professional surfing or, you know, the, the small group of, of surfers that, that the surf media, um, you know, deems, Mm. um, you know, the hot stuff right now or, you know, the, the greatest clips and, and whatnot. But, um, you know, I, I feel like for me, I'm, I'm probably appealing to the people that will never have someone filming their clips. (laughs) You know, it's not necessarily. That's why I'm a fan. Right. <laughs> I'm never going to have anyone filming my stuff. Um, it's amazing seeing the level of, of the kids these days and mm. seeing the progression that um, is um, available uh, to them when, when they start believing that like, oh yeah, I can do an air reverse. Like, mm. fuck. I'm 34 and I'm like, man, maybe I could do an air reverse. <laughs> I need to start writing the boards that are, are uh, applicable to that. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's wild because, you know, on, on one hand you want to continue to like push the sport, but on the other hand, for me, I'm way more interested in the surf therapy realm and in the, um, in the medicinal realm and in the more lifestyle, like never going to be a professional surfer. That's kind of the people that I want to appeal to because there's not a lot of um, media out there for them, um, you know, but uh, not everyone that watches professional or competitive surfing is wanting to be a, a competitive surfer. You know, as surfers will enjoy watching surfing. That's just what we do. I just, I just think it's more interesting when there is that exchange of ideas, you know, like you mentioned, you referenced Steph Gilmore before, like, I know that there's, there's people on tour that reference you. I know there's people in the building that reference you where they're like, what was my favorite server is Leah Dawson, you know? And I think it's just that much more exciting. Like, and I, I ask this question a lot when we have like CT surfers and I'm like, do you ever, ever, ever like write anything other than like your Ferrari shortboard? Right. And so rarely do I get a yes. Like usually it's like, there's no way I can't be sharp a hundred percent of the time I have to, I have, and I get it. Like, I really right. get that. But it's like the creativity, whether it's like a Kelly or a Dane, like writing it at that level is just so exciting. And then, and vice versa. And you, I remember, um, I'm going to, I'm going to tie this in like a weird Aurora Boris, but like, like Wayne Bartholomew uh, was in the Justin Gain a uh, film about Brendan Margison, who's like mm-hmm. the f- world's first free surfer or whatever. Right. Kind of, well, not, probably not the world's first free surfer, but certainly like one of the more higher paid ones. And and he had this comment. He's like, yeah, yeah, everyone wants to be a free surfer. He goes, but the, the reality is you have to be really fucking good. Right. He goes, Margo is really, really good, you know, like, and he did all the contest stuff when he was younger and that's how he got really good. And that's not the only way to get really good, but sure. it is really important, you know, because I think a lot of people are like, I'm going to get a fish or a mid length and be cool. And like, that's my path. It's like, Hey, if that's your path and you have a good time doing that, go for it. It, You you have to understand that there's like decades of experience where someone's been able to put their board in that position on a wave to get that feeling kind of thing. So I don't know. That's a long way of me saying like, 
I just think everything is so much more interesting when you have that exchange of ideas, whether it's boards or um, your politics or, or whatever it is, like surfing is just better for it. Yeah, it is. You know, I, I think that we're seeing surfing kind of burst open and a lot more different conversations are being had now mm -hmm. and purpose is being brought to the front of the table. And now it's not just about how good you surf. It's about also your platform and, and um, what you believe in. And, and it's yes, definitely in some uh, instances, like the way you look and the way you present yourself and, and whatnot. Um, but it, it's it's wild like i've i've gotten some comments online like you're a surfer you know stop talking about politics <laughs> <laughs> wait no i'm a human and i love to surf and uh politics matter because you know we all live on this planet and our collective policies uh determine the health of not only the planet, but every individual that's living on it. Um, so I don't think we can really separate the fact. And, you know, as you said, like, I, it's to be apolitical uh, is, I don't know. I don't know how we can be anymore. Uh, totally. I mean, I, 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 it's just <laughs> a, a topic, a conversation that has like, sort of grown in intensity for me personally over the last few weeks. But yeah, I mean, I told a story um, the other week when we had Salema and Pat on, and and I said um, when I started at the is the ASP in two thousand five, like someone told me, like, yeah, uh, well, surfing is apolitical. The ASP is apolitical. And the reason it is, is because we want to appeal to the broadest sure. fan base possible and the broadest sponsorship group possible. And at 22, uh, being a white male from America, it's like, totally makes sense. I get it. Smart, real smart. Sure. And it, it's one of those things of, of, of reflection and introspection that 2020 has provided me with, which is, yeah, I had the, I'm one of the only people that can be apolitical. Or, or could even kind of pursue the myth of apoliticism is probably a more accurate way to put it, you know, and I never had to think about anybody else. And to your point, it's, it's one of those things I've been kind of going back and forth with people who have been uh, barking, you know, a, a shut up and play kind of approach to right. the topics of conversation lately. And it's like, hey, like, uh, you know, we're giving these people these platforms because we're fans. And I don't think you have a right to enjoy them in whatever dimension you see fit and ignore the rest. You know, if they want to use that platform that you gave them to speak their truth, like that, that's, that's their right, you know, in a lot of ways. And it's just, yeah, I don't know. 2020 feels like that's, that's, it's become a reckoning around that topic in particular. Yeah. Big time. It's, um, it's amazing seeing like watching Tyler mm. take such a stand, um, and, and the ripple effects that it, that it has and, and, um, athletes in all different sectors and all different realms, like, wait, we're, we're human first, you know? Mm. And, and 2020 for me has really put it in a, the perspective of this is really the first time, um, that we've all been dealing with the, it, it brought like the, the, connection of the climate crisis um the pandemic has brought us all everyone in the world knows like corona you know we're all dealing with this same wild um virus but also all the trickle down effects of of everything that um is affected by it um but in the same sense like it's also bringing together uh, the understanding that we're all very much in this climate crisis together and it is together that we have to learn how to get out of it. It, it is the collective, like one, one country over here doing one thing right, mm -hmm. like is not going to save uh, 
save the ship or all the ships. Yeah, it to- uh, I mean, totally. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't score the planet doing very well there. I mean, there's sort of that, like the movie trope of like, you know, it's the, it's the world at war and the only thing that galvanized everyone was like an alien invasion. It's like, <laughs> This is kind of our version of an alien invasion. Like we're all impacted by this and we're not working together. Like, come on, like. No, no, we're not. And it's, it's become clearly like even more profoundly um, divisive, especially in America, Um, you know, living, living through what uh, we'll look back in history as, as a profound civil rights movement. Um, and just all the extreme variables that are that are at play, I think surfers are recognizing like, wait, you know, while while scientists are saying that like there's still things that we can do, um, surfers have to like be a voice saying, hey, we 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 can we can do this together, like let's do this together. And right. for me, like having a platform is having a duty to, to help, um, share love and share positivity and, and help, um, do our best to like, as a society, as a global society, like, let's just turn and, and add into a, a different direction. That's not spiraling, um, you know, out of control. Um, but it's been amazing seeing surfers like kind of feeling that responsibility to on, on both the community level, um, in the average everyday people going out to surf, but also on the highest level of, of, of competition. Um, you know, we, we see people wanting to take responsibility and wanting to take a stand and to, um, be loud for, for the things that need speaking up for. Mm. You mentioned the idea of purpose and I want to ask, is that, is that something even when you were little where it was like, yeah, I I want to be good at something because it's a platform to have a purpose or is that something that you feel kind of came as, as, as you got older? Um, Because it's something I, I, I've actually had a kind of a parallel conversation, not through the podcast, but just through a lot of surfers over the years where it's like, what's your goal? I want to be a world champion. Okay. Why? And when, every time you ask why they're like, Ooh, I don't know. Like, or, or it's like, yeah. I want to prove my brother's wrong or, or whatever it is. And it's like, okay. But you realize like doing that, like there's a, there's a big why you can answer. You don't have to have the answer now, but like it, it as you said, it's a platform. So I'm wondering if that's something, if, if that's kind of a, a philosophy that you've, you've come to later in life or if that was always there for you. Um, no, I think it was it was there from like a, a from like a very early age. I always felt like I'd I didn't know what like past lives were yet when I was really young, but I had like this very familiar feeling like I've been here before and I have to do something with this life to like help people. And um you just have to help people. That's it. Like just bring love and, and be of service. And, and I did go to like a, a first Baptist school for four years and learn some great things and learn some things that I had to reprogram my brain away from thinking that people were going to hell. Um, but I loved the morality that I learned and I loved, um, the, the like foundational, um, goodness that at least it uh on you know on a lot of levels um religion you know points towards stewardship and towards love and um treating our neighbors with respect and um and so i always wanted to live my life like jesus even when i like stopped believing um or necessarily like adhering to uh, a Christian path, so to speak, and more so spirituality came, came over. I still like always resonated with wanting to live a life that was of the light and of um, a positive influence. Um, And then once I realized like 
surfing was something that like could make you make other people have eyes on you if you did really well at it. I saw this as a a way to share that love and to spread goodness and light and positivity um, in a place where I often saw darkness or or divisiveness Mm. um, and uh, just wanting to like have a voice of inclusion and of celebration um, rather than always critique and uh, separateness. So, yeah, I would say it's definitely been innate in me. It became more profound Um, in college. I actually, like, I wrote a TV show called Changing Tides, which we later named our our, uh, foundation after. Um, But it was a TV show that I had ended up developing, like, with my with my professor, we never ended up getting it off the ground, but maybe we will. Um, uh, This podcast is a good way to start. Yeah. Right. Um, Uh, And throw it back out into the universe. Exactly. Um, Yeah. About uh, traveling for surfing and, and each place you go, you team up with um, a local surfer and a local group that is doing give back work. So you learn about different social, economical, um, environmental challenges that this location is going through and the work that's being done to help um so that we we bring awareness to um to what our planet is facing and also um shine light on people that are are doing um the grace of of doing their best to help um and so when we ended up wanting to start a foundation back in 2016 we were trying to come up with a name and i'm like Oh, well, you know, I've, I've had this, like, this idea that I've been wanting to do and this foundation, this idea of like wanting to help and connect people and collaborate and, and energize surfers to, to give back along their travels and, and to reach outside of ourselves to tell stories and, and connect with, with individuals on a deeper level. Like, that's pretty much what this TV show is about and it, the name kind of flows. So let's, let's just go for it. And, um, what are some yeah. of the places that, that you guys have focused that work on? Um, we've done, um, a few different women's, uh, mentorship programs that we call WAMP, um, <laughs> in Panama and, in uh, Dominican Republic, um, collaborating with an amazing, um, foundation over there called Mariposa, which means butterfly. And, um, they, Oh, they educate girls. Um, they're like their after school education, but they're pretty much like their primary school. And the first thing that they do when they get girls in their program is teach them how to swim because they believe that that's, um, that is the freedom maker. And, and when you learn how to swim, you, you, uh, learn this, this breadth of, of ability um, and self-confidence that, um, is really powerful. Um, so yeah, we've done, uh, work in Peru and, um, we're starting to, to figure out some programs here in, in California and, and do some more work on the ground here. And, um, uh, we started a, a composting business on the North shore called community compost movement. And out of a dream to just like not throw food in the trash. Anymore, because it's it's just crazy that we've um as a world society like so quickly in the last 50 years stopped composting and and instead like filled landfills full of rotting food that releases methane instead of composting in our soil and making food Uh, there, yeah, there's a lot to, to work on in, in our world. And that was kind of our, our goal with changing tides was to like, we can pick project by project of, of different things that we can do to help, but we can also make media campaigns that, um, will help, um, educate people on, on things that maybe we don't always think about, or especially raising awareness around, uh, single use plastic, uh, which, um, seems like the uh it's so visceral it's right in front of us we can 
see it, we can taste it, we can feel it. You know, climate change is something that's really big and, and a little bit more opaque. Uh, right. Maybe not as much with like the fires raging right now, but it's definitely more abstract, though, it, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's more more abstract. But the plastic problem is something that like it's undeniable. Um, but yet we're slated to continue to way increase our plastic production in the U.S. And right now we're the number one export of ethane, which is a byproduct of fracking. Um, because we have very lax laws of fracking in the U.S. So we export ethane all around the world uh, so others can make plastic as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like, yes, we're doing all this hard work to uh, eliminate single-use plastics, yet like the big guys at the top are, are gearing up for like as, as fossil fuels go down in, in how much we're using them in our, our cars, they're wanting to increase plastic production with the oil that they still have. Um, so it, I think that that's definitely an area for, for myself that I want to continue to learn and push as a uh, loud voice and, and work more on the policy side of things. I got to go to um, Capitol Hill with Surfrider this year. Um, and speak with constituents um, and some different senators, and and we got to speak on on um, a climate change panel um, with the the Senate um, committee for climate change. And um, there's definitely people that know it's real um, and know what we're what we're up against. Um, and there's definitely that was such an interesting trip for me because it, um, I was both encouraged, but I was also like, my eyes were kind of opened at like how embedded all these issues are. And the one takeaway was for me was how important it is f for us to vote and for us to put in people of power in every, from local to state to federal, uh, people that have the earth's back. Um, because the power that um, these positions hold are far greater than just a description of a job title. Like, these people are controlling the health of the future. <laughs> the, you know, it's like, you're totally right. Like some of these systems and the reality can be like completely paralyzing. I just circling back to the Changing Tides Foundation, like I think it's such a rad thing because surfing is unquestionably like a selfish pursuit for a lot of us a mm -hmm. lot of the time. And we love to travel. We love to go on surf trips, but the idea that you could inject that trip with with purpose is such a good concept, right? Because then people, it's it's not so much to assuage the guilt, but it's like, hey, I'm, I'm actually making an impact here. And as you said, it's like, you can't surf on all the tides. Like, it's you got to do something else, like, with your time. Like, why not do that, uh, making an impact on the community? I just think yeah. that's great. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a, a big thing, you know? Yeah. It could be a couple water filters. It could be school supplies, it could be menstrual cups, it could be um, just taking a local kid out surfing or leaving a board behind or just kind of going outside of ourselves a little bit um, because oftentimes a little bit goes a long way, especially in places that don't have a lot. Mm. Um, and that's, to that's totally right. And, and you... You're also doing work in Africa, right? Yourself yeah. is that is that within the Changing Tides Foundation, or is it that is, separate? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of spearheaded it with a friend that um, has a foundation over there, and I'm representing Changing Tides with the work that we've we've been doing to get it ready to to move over. We're um, we're starting a, a women's surf therapy program for victims of sexual abuse, and um, and also um, uh, survivors of, of war 
um, and but also um, teaching and providing sewing machines and um, building a, a a sewing shop for them so that they can make their own bathing suits to go in the water um, and also develop jobs so that they can have jobs in order to sell bathing suits and go in the water. Um, so it's, it's quite a, it's definitely the largest project that I've ever done. Um, and, and where can people go to find out more about, uh, yeah, you can go to changing tides foundation and we'll, we'll have, um, information about that project as it, um, continues to evolve. That's awesome. I mean, it is beyond inspiring what you're doing with your platform in 2020. And I know for a fact it inspires, uh, surfers both on and off tour. Um, and you know, for as painful as 2020 has been for so many people, I think, uh, you know, taking the time to reflect and, and realize what people can do, you know, with their voices and with their platforms is, is unquestionably one of the positives that's come out of it. We did, uh, we did go to the Instagram community, uh, to see if anyone had some questions for you and, uh, we had to fight them off with a stick. We only picked three of them, um, but they were, they were ample. Um, so Ed Kirk 87 asks, what is your favorite board of all time that you've owned? Interesting. Hmm. Favorite board of all time that I've owned. Um, probably I have this board named White Lightning that uh, my boyfriend Alex Lopez shaped for me. And um, I wrote it all winter last winter. It's a 7 0 single fin with um, a little tiny wing in the tail. And it's a uh, kind of a modern take on one of his dad's old retro um, single fins from the 70s. And um, it's also the first bolt, uh, lightning bolt that Alex put on a board. So it's kind of special and um, momentous in, in that way and something that I cherish a lot. And um, I've gotten a few pumping days at Rockies on it, just gliding in and grabbing rail and holding on for dear life. Um, but I also have a couple favorite boards that I didn't own and that I ended up buckling of my friends that <laughs> Alex and I are actually trying to recreate this like really cool five, four, like almost like raised deck board, um, that my friend let me borrow like 10 years ago. And I've been like still dreaming of the sessions that I had on this board 10, 12 years ago and trying to recreate the board from memory right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good answer. Ed, you're not allowed to ask anyone else that question. Cause I feel like uh, <laughs> those answers are not going to stand up to that one. All right. Um, Calum dot asks what, who has influenced you to become the surfer and person you are today. Jeez, that's a, that's a big one. I feel like that's been, that, that, Calum, that's been my entire podcast. <laughs> if, so, so I guess if you had to distill it down to a singular person that's been the most influential in your life, surfing and, and humanity-wise, who would that be? Um, to be honest, probably uh, Cassia Mater. She's still one of my best friends, and, and um, she was the first surfer that I recognized style in. And I was always like, wow, Cassia style. When I was a girl, I'm like 16, 17. And I became friends with her when I was 15. And um, was just like always amazed. She seemed like this like goddess mentor that just was cool to me and like took me totally under her wing. And um, But as we've grown older, she's continued to not only be a, um, a surfing inspiration, but um, oh, tremendously a life inspiration in utilizing every day to quench a thirst for knowledge and expansion and um, definitely going outside the realm of just our five senses and, and exploring healing and um, music and sound and all the amazing things that she's interested in. She's um, yeah, definitely been an amazing guide and mentor in my life. All right. And arrow. Oh man. Arosendale, 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 I'm not sure, asks, who are your favorite surfers that influence your style? 
Um, let's see. Well, Cassie is definitely on that list. Um, Ryan Birch. Um, whew, could watch him surf all day. Um, <laughs> Derek Disney. I love his surfing. Um, both of those guys on, on any board from long to short are just phenomenal. Um, I want to surf a long twin fin like Tor and Martin, very much so. <laughs> um, and then women wise, um, Karina Rosanko and Michaela Smith um, on on a longboarding feat. And then um, I think anyone would have to say Stephanie Gilmore, right? <laughs> Those are good answers. Okay, final segment. This is our lightning round. So these are 10 questions. You can answer as quickly as you can. Wait. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Oh, uh, single fin. Coffee or tea? Oh, coffee. Burrito or pizza? Neither. Mm. Last book you read? Um... It's called The Ringing Cedars of Russia. Best surf film ever. Morning of the Air. One wave you never have to go back to. Um, Porto Plata in, in the Dominican Republic. If you only got to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Uh, Rockies. Best person to share the lineup with. My boyfriend. Alex Lopez. Worst person to share the lineup with. Mm-hmm. Me? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I strongly disagree. I enjoy serving with you every opportunity <laughs> I get. Last question. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Uh, going to one of my best friend's birthday parties this evening. Leah Dawson, thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you for coming on the lineup. Um, Good luck to you. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much, Dave. Do you like that? Well, if so, subscribe over there and then watch more videos over there. And then tell us your favorite videos down there. It's a three-step process. Do them all now.